Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. In weather, expect heavy snowfall and mysterious lights around the Jefferson Tract over the next few days. Meteorologists and black helicopters are flying in to witness this rare phenomenon. One accompanying soldier said was called, for sure, not UFOs. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Khan. Hey, everybody. And Benjamin Graham. Hello, constant readers. And today we are covering another Patreon selection by Lisa Khan, Dreamcatcher, where we are reading through part one. And we have Josh leading our discussion. Yeah. Do you guys believe in aliens? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I mean, yes and no. The universe is so vast that the odds that we're the only life that's ever developed is pretty low. But also it's been around for so long and will be around for so long that thinking that they exist at the same time as us or anywhere that they can be anywhere near us, probably not. Interesting. See, I'm- Basically what Ben said, I don't believe in gray men necessarily, as we've seen throughout history and pop culture, but I do definitely believe there's life on other planets and moons. Europa, there's water under there. Has to be something. Yeah, And if there is life, it's going to be so fundamentally different. Like a humanoid aliens, not a chance mm-hmm. in hell. The, the idea of simultaneously evolving to have two legs, two arms, and a head is yeah. pretty insane. Now, toothy worm monsters... For sure. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I've seen Dune. (laughs) Well, I asked that because this book, before it even gets to the book, is just a list of UFO sightings. Wait, farts must flow. Anyway. (laughs) uh, (laughs) God, I hate that. Never mind. Yeah, this is a real farty book. Ugh. It's a farty burpy book. I, you, If you told me that Stephen <laughs> King wrote a book that was like 90% fart jokes, I would have been like, uh, yeah, okay. And then it happens and you're like, why? <laughs> it, it feels like it shouldn't be as ominous as it turns out to be. Uh, well, okay, so let's get into to Dreamcatcher. I'm really, really interested in by the time we complete part one to find out where the story is going. I've not read this. Have both of you read this? Yeah. No. Oh, your first time Uh, then. I have never read it. I have seen the movie Mm. years ago, and the only thing I remember is it wasn't good. (laughs) Um, The the end. I I remember thinking, this movie's insane. What is happening? (laughs) And uh, I think it's adapted pretty well. So far, (laughs) yeah. Uh, I guess. (laughs) Uh, well, in, in this book, we have the way I described it to someone is it's the body with farts. Or sorry, uh-huh. grown up the body with farts. The, I just like, out of context, the body with farts. <laughs> 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 well, saying stand by me would be an easier reference, but it doesn't sound nearly as funny. You know what's weird? Because mm. you're totally right. I remember having difficulty feeling attached to the characters in Stand By Me in the body, but I love our guys in Dreamcatcher. That's insane, (laughs) but we'll get to it. And I I do agree that you're right, that it does have shades of the body, but the whole book, I kept thinking of it in terms of just this cosmic gumbo, if you will, of Stephen King's own ideas, just all thrown into a big blender. That's what I like about it. I mean, the way you describe it makes it sound sort of slapped together. <laughs> I Which 1000% believe think, it is. Yes. <laughs> but I I love all of the little threads that are part of a very specific Stephen King universe. Mm-hmm. And this book fits right into that. Whether it does it with as much grace as some other books have, I don't know. <laughs> I I do know grace <laughs> is the how do we even put it this is the least graceful book i've ever read (laughs) this book is like (laughs) 
if if a book like you know the body is the body is the dream catcher what the movie the body or stand by me is to a movie someone made of a bunch of horror movies chopped together and constructed into one mess <laughs> in a good way i like this is what i'm trying to oh, say okay I, what I'm trying to say is it's it's a crazy book in the way that Tommy Knockers was crazy, where it's just a million ideas thrown at a wall, you know? And some of them that you look at and you're like, oh, this idea was used somewhere else. Y- Given, depending on the timeline. If, yeah. Uh, I don't remember the order any of these things came out in, so I don't know if it's a new <laughs> idea or an old idea. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is I hate all of the characters. <laughs> okay. okay, let's... I, I love the way we get to meet our four main characters in this first part where they each get their own short story, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is funny because of how often we've kind of talked about that when we get King short stories, that you get a chance to really flesh them out. So uh, let's let's dive into that. First, we have Beaver. We meet Beaver in 1988 going through some hard times. CM, you want to tell us what's good, what's happening to Beaver? Yeah, Beaver has recently been divorced. And it sounds like he wasn't super into being divorced, but she was. <laughs> <laughs> that is <laughs> a great interesting way to put way. that. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's realizing that he's kind of falling into a, a spiral of, of not giving a fuck. He's drinking too much, smoking too much pot, just hanging around with people kind of doing nothing. And we we meet him at a bar where he is with some other guys that frequent that place. And this one guy's telling a story about a concert he went to and he has a quote hickey <laughs> on his neck. Yeah. And he starts talking about how he got this hickey and Beaver, Joe is his actual name, I believe. Mm-hmm. He's the Beav, has this this internal monologue where he is he knows what the guy's gonna say and not just because he's heard him tell shitty stories before it's a supernatural thing which i thought was really cool like immediately you're like "Ooh, powers all right right <laughs> it, it is yeah he sees the line is he the first one to say the line i think it's pete, pete. says the line yeah. Pete say, I, yeah he he can know things that he shouldn't know which to me takes a huge backseat to the way he fucking talks. What do you mean? What do I mean? <laughs> yeah. Are you going to make me list <laughs> the how many beavisms? The sheer <laughs> amount of th- this guy wins the prize for the most catchphrases. <laughs> Yeah, it is It is definitely quantity over quality. <laughs> <laughs> that is a kind way to put it. Well, he does have a lot of shit. He does. It's, it's like a book of Mad Libs. <laughs> yeah. God, what are some of them? First of all, the overarching most important one, same shit, different day, that they speak, they, they talk about it as though they are the f- first people to have come up with it. They're the first people to summarize it to SSDD. <laughs> Uh, bitch in a buzzsaw is my favorite one of Beavis' oh, we're going around the horn. Kiss my bender. That hurts <laughs> me to even say it. It's so fucking stupid. What was the bananas one? Who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's just an, an unending litany. And every other character that talks about the beaver are like, man, he had such a way with words. <laughs> he, he really could like hit creative really great obscene profanity and it's the dumbest shit but when you're a kid that's it's it's not as funny as an adult but i get that all those things were probably hilarious as a kid Mm -hmm. and they just it's kind of a holdover now was there something else about no he tells that guy crotchless panties and leaves (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that, I mean, that's is that, there a better yeah. way to put that no and we're just gonna <laughs> yeah, leave it at yeah. that and he heads out into the night uh next we in 1993 we meet pete ben do you want to tell us what happens with pete i was actually a little confused by this because one of the things that the beaver says in the beginning is he needs to stop drinking or pretty soon he's gonna have a problem like pete has a problem mm. well we meet pete and he's a car salesman who has a, a NASA keychain because he mm. 
dreamed of being an astronaut as a kid, but he's he's kind of a dummy and uh, has grown up to be what I was like. This guy seems like a, just a pretty successful, normal dude. And he keeps being like, oh, I can't drink because it's not five. Only alcoholics drink after five. And I'm like, he's waiting. Like, this guy, <laughs> he's this guy's fine. What's <laughs> making the big deal? Later on. Sure. Yeah. Mm. I think if you have to have, it's good to have hard <laughs> rules around something like that. But if you are in need of them, there's as probably someone, a reason. <laughs> as someone who is several years sober. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he is sitting in his car dealership board. And a lady comes in having lost her keys. And another reason I was like, he's he's so charming yeah. that it's you you get why people would like him, why he would be fr- have this friend group. Well, his his specialty is so much more like tangible or mm-hmm. visceral than the others. I think his his introduction was my favorite, just because it was so much easier to picture and like the way he was watching her in his mind, I felt like I was watching him watch her in his mind it it is one of my favorite parts Mm -hmm. of the book you get a real liking for the character more than any of the other characters in my opinion well i wonder if that's because he is an addict and Mm -hmm. king you know really knows how to write that character and that's kind of close to his heart like you said he has this ability which something once we meet all of our characters i do have a question about these powers Mm -hmm. they're real (laughs) ill-defined But his ability is he can find lost things. He holds up a finger in front of his his face and ticks it back and forth. What does he say? It's like a... Um, it's like a ritual. Yeah. And once he does that, he can see this yellow glow. And he follows it around this... Uh, to the to the convenience store and then to her car and reaches into a puddle and pulls out her keys and she acts like it is the scariest thing that has ever happened to her. Okay, this is weird because well, it's a little more scary than that because he's telling her things she did and said that he wasn't there to witness. Mm. That were very like you wouldn't necessarily just guess that specifically, but I was also upset that she uh, if if I was a single lady and a dude found my keys that way. I'd be like, heck yeah, I'll meet you if I. In fact, screw this house sale. Let's go out now. <laughs> it's so cool. He's, and he's so smooth he's so about nice. it. Like yeah. th- when they were meeting, I was like, oh, this is like a thing. I, mm-hmm. I like these two. I hope they're happy. Uh, <laughs> but as soon as he he does this, she immediately jumps in her car and drives away, leaving Pete to be like, well, shit. But he's still he's feeling happier having helped someone well, because he saw the line his power and because he heard the click he saw the mm-hmm. line and that's not something that many of them have been experiencing as much as when they were kids and it's still just sad that he still goes to the place that she said she'd meet him yeah. <laughs> oh yeah he sits at the bar he's and... still a hugely sad person all four of our the, main characters are mm-hmm. yes i my favorite thing about his whole chapter though is when he's like it's fine trish she hasn't said her name yet whoops she, <laughs> did, she did not catch that cool and just moves on <laughs> next we meet in 1998 we meet henry because henry is uh, taking care of a couch man I'm also a bit of a couch man myself. Uh, I don't know about you guys. Absolutely. <laughs> why, why would you not sit on a couch? Yeah. If my options are couch or chair, I'm taking couch all day, baby. Man, Henry's story bugs me. Really? This is. <laughs> this is. What? The, are you being sarcastic? Yes. Oh. This I is loved the it. part where I texted you. I have never hated a book this much. <laughs> it was. I was uh, misplacing my anger at the book. It should have been directed just at the character, Henry. Really? a dick (laughs) and bad at his fucking job. I think that's why I like him. I'm a dick and bad at my job. (laughs) This is not an excuse. It's to understand his behavior. He is sinking into a black depression. So hopefully he at some point was a good psychiatrist but he is not recently yeah and and i I agree but (laughs) yeah like you said mental health isn't you know an excuse to berate a clearly mentally unwell man (laughs) when you've spent however many years not treating him basically exactly and i don't don't know like 
maybe it's different for psychiatrists because my my license is for social work. It's not cool to just be like, well, I'll just take his money and let him continue yeah. to be neurotic and not try to address it. You would probably try to refer them to someone who maybe could help them better. Than yeah, you. that uh, someone that doesn't actively dislike them. That is such a huge... Okay, so he, Henry is a psychiatrist. He's seeing this guy, Barry, who... Loves food as much as I do. He is 5'7", <laughs> 420 pounds, and a compulsive eater with a trust fund. It is, once again, Stephen King. <laughs> I know you're not listening to this. And I, I deeply love you and your works. But we gotta talk, my man. What's your problem with fat people? <laughs> did, one of, did one of us hurt you? <laughs> did one of us hurt you? <laughs> I, I want to know, because it is written with such an obvious distaste. It is not even just like, oh yeah, this guy was really fat. It is like, this guy's fat, fuck him. <laughs> I don't the, disagree. That's yeah, how it was, yeah. The, the only way that I got through this part, honestly, was making a discovery that I would like to share with our listeners. Not just for Stephen King. This is for any time anyone is... Uh, being fat phobic just replace the word fat with thick the end that's the the trick at one point he's talking barry this patient of his the reason he has this problem is he thinks he killed his mother his mother was a uh, hypochondriac and was always yelling and he didn't go to get her when she fell out of her bed and died but during this he in his head henry describes her as disgustingly fat at 300 pounds and it's way funnier if the phrase is henry didn't know couldn't have known that his mother was disgustingly thick <laughs> and that's fantastic <laughs> yeah i sign off on yeah. this i yeah. sign okay. fat is out thick is in <laughs> anyway can i say the one my one favorite moment from Barry, though, was the way he described mm -hmm. how he orders burgers so that the cheese is really hot. That is gold. That made my <laughs> mouth water. It's like, I respect <laughs> that shit. <laughs> Barry's a, a guy with a plan, you know? <laughs> yeah. But he's, he's just a kindly, innocent food pervert. Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> there's, it's, it's clear that there's been some terrible... There's terrible feelings here. And Henry basically checks out and he starts thinking about Hole in the Wall, uh, which is the name of the cabin that they would go hunting in and how all of his friends are going to be together and the Jefferson tract soon. Because all of these stories seem to take place are in different years, but around the same time that the hunting trip is nearby. Mm -hmm. So it's always this thing that's on the horizon looking forward to. <laughs> but after he comes out of it and he he's like, hey, you think you eat too much because you killed your mom? <laughs> and which goes about as well as you would think. It's more than that. He is like purposefully berating. Yeah, this he's poking guy. Yeah. him. He knows he needs to stop, and Barry's upset, and he doesn't. Yeah, he's even thinking in his like in his head. He's like, he knows he should stop, but this feels pretty cool. <laughs> I I thought that line though that he tells him really mean, but beautiful about how he's like his heart is like somebody beating their fists against the coffin. Like he's dying. That just the way that was put together is like, if somebody said that to me, I would be upset, but I'd have to stop and be like, wow, that was super poetic. Are you a poet? <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> and then Barry, a couple years later, does die. At the ripe old age of. Yeah, it's too bad like he didn't have a shrink that mm -hmm. fucking gave a shit. <laughs> but it's, and it's weird that Henry, well, the fact that Henry calls about it later either implies he's been following this guy or that Barry came back. No, no he's not in the oh, newspaper. Yeah, that's right. But it it does imply that he knows he messed up and he does somewhere feel guilty about it. Yeah. And lastly, we meet Jonesy, who is uh, an associate professor in Boston and uh, in, in the year 2001. And it is a day that he will never remember. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. He, he's my favorite, but I think I'm biased because I cannot picture him as anyone other than Damian Lewis, who plays him <laughs> in the movie, and I love him. I, that's another thing, is reading this book, is I remember the cast yeah. of the movie, but I don't remember who played who. Oh, Jason. So in my head, they're all just <laughs> jumbled up, <laughs> and uh, my I know that I'm pretty sure Jason Lee plays the Beef, beaver. Yep. 
but I, I did enjoy imagining Jonesy as Jesus yeah. Lee for some oh. reason. <laughs> this, this, though, too, because, okay, I don't want to brag, but I've taught one college course. <laughs> <laughs> Professor C.M. Alexander, mm-hmm. yes. I really liked the way this story went because I, I didn't know, I couldn't remember, it's been a really long time since I read the book. I couldn't remember how this was going to shake out with the student and it was positive, and I really mm-hmm. liked that. And I guess it didn't need to be bad because the thing that happens after that was terrible enough. <laughs> yeah, I was ready to hate the uh, Jonesy because he calls this student in and is like, oh, ready to confront him. He's obviously like cheated or done yeah, something. Yeah, cheated on a to test. Get in trouble. And he starts to like go in on him, and I'm like, oh, it's just fucking Henry all over again. He's, he's just gonna berate this kid while in his head he's like, man, this sucks for me. <laughs> <laughs> But then he he brings a kid aside and he's like, you're on here on scholarship and you know what happens if you get caught cheating. So it's too bad you missed my test, right? Because you're you, sick. Yeah. It is a very cool yeah. move. This is nice. It's very positive. And I, I liked that he, I feel like he wasn't sure what he was going to do with the kid, but then because he reacted with, with remorse, like... It, he didn't try to fight it. He didn't threaten him like, oh, I'm going to go to the board and blah, 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 and you can't do this. He was just ready to accept it. And he's like, well, you know, he's only 19. Maybe there's still potential for him to grow up to be a decent man. And I'll give him a chance. Yeah. yeah. And then there's this offhanded remark that that kid will later send flowers to his hospital room. Oh, yeah, because he tells him. Next time you think about buying beer, buy some new sneakers because his sneakers are messed up. And later it's like, he wouldn't buy beer or sneakers. He sent flowers. I'm like, oh yeah, my God, that's so sweet. great. I, I do have to. I know that we haven't even left the the <laughs> prologue yet, but I do have to say something about this book's use of w- what I'll dub nasty foreshadowing because it is not delicious. It's not done wow, well. This better be real good. It, that part that you just mentioned was pretty good. Yeah. But there's some of the writing is just clumsy. And a lot of the ways that this is set up, uh, there's a lot of these like little foreshadowing bits that he does. It is foreshadow forward. Yes, there's a lot. <laughs> And sometimes it works, but other times, like at the the very first page, we mentioned SSDD, where he says, what's the line? When we were four, we believed SS, or the the first half. And when (laughs) we were five, five, we believed the whole thing. And then when we were four again, we only believed the second. That means nothing. They (laughs) try to explain it later, and it's like, okay, it's a stretch, but fine. (laughs) It is just such a drunk guy thinking he's saying something really <laughs> profound. Which, to be fair, Stephen King was on massive opiates <laughs> while writing this book. It's it's a definitely a book that you benefit from reading and then rereading because then you're like, oh, I know what this means and this means and this means. Mm. And maybe that's not a great way to set up a book, but it's fun on the second read. <laughs> oh, the other Good. the other important thing that happens during Jonesy's part is that Henry calls him up right before this kid gets there for his appointment and he's like hey just be careful today and he's so relieved by this appointment having gone well that he changes his plans for the afternoon he was going to have his lunch at his office and now he goes outside to have it and then gets hit by a car and almost dies (laughs) yeah that's that's rough and then we jump into the actual events of the book that begins with him say them saying uh, killing Richard McCarthy wouldn't have hurt, but it might have helped. I, and I was like, I like "What that. the fuck <laughs> is going on?" And Richard McCarthy and Becky are mentioned in the very like first page too. Oh, I totally missed that. Mm-hmm. God damn. They are? Yep. Huh. See, second read. I listened to this five times before today. You're a you're an insane person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we open up with Jonesy is up in uh, in a tree. The the deer. The deer blind. Yes. Yeah. Wait, it's a bird blind. It's a deer lookout. I think it's still. Are they all blind? It's it's still blind. Yeah, because you can't see them. Everything I know about hunting came from that one episode of King of the Hill. So, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I went to school uh, in the country, and everybody got the day. The first day of hunting season was officially a day off of school. Oh my god! (laughs) Because otherwise, no one was there. Yeah, yeah. We had a kid drive his pickup to school with a deer in the back. The dead deer in the back. He'd forgotten to take it out before he came to school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jesus. 
So Jonesy's up in the tree blind. He got up there, not just because his joints hurt if he's down and it's cold, but he's kind of realized he doesn't want to kill anything anymore, but he still wants to hang out and drink beers. I love the way that he describes his feeling too, because he's he's talking about it in terms of, you know, death came to find me that day on the road. It came to find me in the hospital. It missed me. And I'm not interested in inviting death around, even if I'm the one dealing it. Until he almost deals it. <laughs> that was really... So uh, growing up in the country, is this like a thing that you've heard about or not? Hunting about? accidents? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> the eye fever? Yeah. I No, I've never heard anybody explain eye fever before. So I think that might be made up. I mean, I, I guess it's possible because if, you, if your brain is saying, I hear sounds, must be a deer... Because it's only deer out here, you will see signs of a deer. Or a lot of people have gotten away with killing their spouses and children on hunting accidents. Yeah, it's because hunting is dangerous and accidents happen. Mm. And sometimes those accidents end up with you getting a lot of money. Note to self, <laughs> do not go hunting with CM. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say Josh. He's no, the one. definitely CM. You're right. <laughs> Wink. No, wait, sorry, that was... <laughs> I'm not supposed to say it. Yeah. He is a, essentially a half a pound of pressure on his finger away from shooting Rick in the head because he's like, oh, there's an eye. Turns out that's just a button. Those were antlers. Those are just branches he walked by. But he's about to pull the trigger and then he sees this man stumble out who looks just kind of lost and is mumbling to himself over mm -hmm. and over. It's a kind of creepy introduction. Super creepy if you think about it. I, I have this theory... This book would be extremely good and extremely scary if you removed all dialogue and what anyone thinks. If it was just a very dry accounting of the things that happen, yeah. it would be terrifying. Rick's it, whole introduction and interactions and everything with them is a horror movie. Yes, it is an awesome, like, inciting incident of this stranger lurching out of the woods. Mm -hmm. But, Instead, we get farts. <laughs> yeah, but then everyone starts farting and <laughs> pooping aliens and whatnot. Yeah, jumping ahead there, Ben. Oh, spoiler <laughs> alert. Someone poops an alien Someone later. Someone poops an alien. Poop implies a voluntary situation. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Never Jonesy. involuntarily pooped? Well, I guess I Come have. on. <laughs> grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I have to grow up? I don't. <laughs> Have I not had enough Come on. diarrhea to Come be an on. adult? Grow up. <laughs> There's a limit you of diarrhea shit. you have you to have shit your pants? Grow up. Come on. No, I have never accidentally <laughs> shit my pants. I have heard so many stories about other people doing it. I'm baffled. Come on. It, it happens. Grow up. Grow up, Sam. Grow up. We're all adults. Oh my God. Everybody Jesus. poops their pants. I think you guys need to grow <laughs> up. Oh. Everybody poops. Their pants. <laughs> As adults. As adults. Yeah. There's that famous book <laughs> that I wrote. <laughs> oh my, okay, let's keep going. Yeah. Jonesy watches this guy walk forward until he sees hole in the wall and starts going towards it and then falls in the snow and just starts yelling, oh dear, over and over again. So Jonesy... He's like fucking he, Piglet well, from yes. Winnie the Pooh. Because he wants Jonesy to know that he is a deer. Oh dear, oh dear, I'm a deer. I'm a deer. Was, I could have made that better, but I didn't want to. <laughs> Jonesy climbs down and comes up to him, and he's just so happy. He sees a building, he sees a person, and Jonesy takes him inside to get him warm, try to figure out where the hell he came from. Uh, and this is where we get a, a description of Hole in the Wall, which it's not lavish by any means. It's it's a nice hunting cabin mm -hmm. with a giant dream catcher hanging over the the center of the living room. Is that right? Yeah. And he gets McCarthy inside. McCarthy like makes him take his jacket off, like you take the jacket off a child. He, yeah, he's he goes back and forth from just being like grateful to be rescued and and just kind of flustered to childlike. And what I thought was really cool is there was a moment where he's he was telling Jonesy that something was like in the woods in the night mm -hmm. and he thought it was a bear or something, but he gives him this weird sideways look. 
And Jonesy gets this awful feeling about it. Like it's a not menacing, but just not the way you would look at somebody. And then he does it again later, but it's not weird. And he's like, oh, I imagine that probably. But that's definitely. It, it is unnerving. And I am positive I've said this about other King books before. But when I read this, I couldn't help but imagine it as directed by Aiden Lynch. Yes. Well, this is where we have Rick sitting down on the couch and he, we finally get some of his story that he says he's been lost in the woods f- since yesterday. He's a lawyer. Him and his friends were up there hunting. They must have gotten split up somehow. And Jonesy's like, it's it's fine. We'll All of my friends are out. We'll get back. We'll find your people and figure out where you came from. And in this conversation, he notices that Rick's missing some teeth. And not just auxiliary teeth. He's missing mm-hmm. the right up front. And he's a lawyer, so... Yeah, and the way he smiles at him, he clearly doesn't know he's missing teeth. Yeah, and he has this weird reddish, orangish patch on his cheek that he keeps mindlessly scratching that they he thinks could be frostbite. Could, could it? Could it please be frostbite? God, it was a little too described as a little too organic to be frostbite. Yeah, and this is when Beave comes back, and huh. it's so Beave brings him his book because he left his book up in the deer blind. Which I thought that was a really nice show of character for Beav. Jesus Christ Bananas. That's what it was. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, yeah, when they... This is the part where I went over. Up to this, I was just, like, not a fan of any of these characters. But the genuine affection between these mm-hmm. two adult men is not something you get in a lot of uh media yeah i was like it, it was so touching mm-hmm. that was a part where i was like I'm, I'm turning around on these guys and was kind of upset that jonesy and beaver didn't get together in the end <laughs> <laughs> the, there's still time no no oh, no in another life on another mm. level of the tower yeah. at this point they see the snow starting to come down and henry and pete went to get beers so they're still not back yet and they're just gonna hunker down and wait and that's when it happens rick farts so loud and for so long <laughs> it embarrasses all three of them <laughs> you, Which, that is you've just written a one sentence synopsis of the first <laughs> the first part of this book <laughs> the characters fart so long and so loud everyone dies even the reader is embarrassed <laughs> It really, really takes its time describing <laughs> Rick's experience with his bowels. See, I imagine the, that just made me think about how intense. Think about the loudest <laughs> barp or fur you fur. <laughs> barp or fur. <laughs> think about the loudest burp or fart you've ever had. And then I'm times sorry. Of I, can't tell time. I need. <laughs> I can't even laugh. Barber it first. broke my brain. God damn it. I knew what I meant. Sam, what's your loudest fart? How do I answer that question? All I'm saying is, would it embarrass me and Ben? I feel like it's just normal loud. <laughs> just normal loud. I don't understand I can't, what you're saying. You never asking. had an exceptional fart. All right, Sam. Grow up. Grow oh up, Sam. Jesus. I hate you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is our worst episode this, yet. This carries on for some time, <laughs> as it did in the show with us, uh, until they finally say, hey, man, just go lay down. Maybe just <laughs> yeah. take a load off. And they notice that the pot belly he had is getting smaller because he's passed so much gas. Mm-hmm. Like they the intensity they thought he was going to either shit everywhere or throw up everywhere. He does neither of these. Yeah. Yet. We should talk about the smell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which Go I'm on, not Sam. Do. It smells like ether and ripe bananas. Which can you think of a worse smell just <laughs> off the top of your head? That sounds neither of those things are like that unpleasant by themselves, but put them together and I don't know, force them out of butt. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I can conjure the smell of ether in it's, my. It's like brain. A, imagine rubbing alcohol. Oh, okay, yeah, that like does that sound unpleasant. Sting, right? That's weird. 
that's weird. Yeah, it's just weird. All right. I couldn't imagine it either. Well, they get him laid down and they move into the kitchen to have a private conversation. And that's when Beaver's like, this is worse than he thinks it is. Because he said he's been missing yesterday. He's been missing for four days. He has lost time. And the, the locations that he's given do not make sense mileage-wise for him to be here. Unless he traveled like 15 miles a day for three days in one night. And he also, they point out that he doesn't have three days worth of growth. Mm. He only has a little bit of stubble. So <laughs> Beaver's like concocting this scenario where for some reason... <laughs> Guy gets lost in the woods, loses his gun, did have his razor in his <laughs> coat pocket, yep. and the last day, he lost it. You know, you know what this part made me think of? The Colorado kid. This mm. is a, a matter of the one of those things that is impossible, but not in a show-offy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we jump to Henry's scout. Henry and Pete on their way back from the store and Henry is just thinking about suicide. I do like the way it, it, it eventually plays out with, well, I don't really have to worry about driving through the storm isn't so bad. What's the worst thing that can happen? I die. <laughs> I have to ask you guys a question about the something while he's d considering suicide. At this point in the book, I switched from reading to the audiobook, mm. which I don't know whether that was a good idea or not because the number of bad Boston accents is <laughs> great. Yeah. At the beginning of this chapter, he's he's thinking about the Hemingway solution, which is obviously shooting yourself in the head with a shotgun. But he also goes over a bunch of other ways he could kill himself. And one of the things he says is like, one way that has really interested him is this thing that he read in one of Jonesy's mystery books. I, I'm doing this, this off the, the top of Japanese my head. Japanese method? Yes. The, there's this Japanese method of killing yourself where you put a big rock on a chair and then you tie a rope around the chair, or, or around, the, around the rock and around your neck, and then you tip the chair over and sit up straight with your back braced and it str It strangles you? Yeah. How? <laughs> wouldn't your... Wouldn't your survival instinct kick in and you would I, move <laughs> i i don't understand I, I i thought it was maybe because i was listening to it and i just couldn't parse what the guy but then i went back and reread that just to try it's completely unimportant to anything but i couldn't figure out the action he is describing <laughs> are you sitting in what what are you sitting on he just says sit with your back braced in another chair then why do you have the first chair why don't you just, <laughs> Are you sitting in the first chair? You're sitting on the rock? You tip See, the chair over, then you fall out and the rock's just on the floor. Just hang yourself, man. I think what he are should, you doing? He should just choke himself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jerk off that way. That's what closets are for. Yeah. So That's they awful. almost run a woman over. In <laughs> their defense, she's sitting in the middle of the road and Henry has been driving a little recklessly and then kind of coming back to himself like, Oh yeah, Pete's with me. Can't kill Pete too. Yeah. <laughs> and and this was kind of mean. Pete was like, "Hey man, slow down." And he's thinking, if Pete had one more beer, he would not notice how fast I was going. Yeah. It's almost like Henry is a huge um dick. Yeah, narcissistic <laughs> asshole that only cares about himself. <gasps> oh, Josh. That's why I like Henry. Oh, yeah. oh man. <laughs> It all comes together. <laughs> why, why you gotta come at me like that, dog? Oh, but they flip their vehicle. <laughs> yeah, that they swerve, and to the point that they would have they would have came in inches from smacking this lady with the rear bumper of the jeep, and they roll over and they crawl it, and she hasn't moved, still hanging out. Bad ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just imagining yeah, her not blinking or flinching as this car almost crushes her. Once again, as a silent, like, just series of events, mm -hmm. if you didn't have Henry, like, imagining nonsense suicide methods or or talking about how big of a piece of shit Pete is, <laughs> mm -hmm. then this is just as a series of images. Very, yeah. very cool. Yeah, they crawl out of the car. Henry gets Pete loose. And they're kind of both worse for the wear. Henry starts laughing like a maniac. And eventually gets himself under control and he goes over to check on this woman and he sees that her eyes are blank. 
There are no tracks in any direction around her. She got big O titties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Oh, and she's also grown and, up. And she's grown up in her 40s. Well, cuz she's farting. And then and then she lets it out. <laughs> she lets it all out. And spooky. <laughs> Although, I don't know, I'm feeling like if you're in a situation where someone was attacking you and you could pull that off, you might get away. <laughs> I Just uh, fart really Farting bad. is self-defense. You're thinking, you're thinking about skunks. Oh, shit. You're thinking <laughs> skunks. But they, he, Henry gets her to her feet and she keeps burping and farting and he's not seeing any recognition come across her face. And I just, I like that he, he's like, we need to move and has Pete grab his belt so that he can walk with her and not take his eyes off her. Because the second he does, he knows she's going to hit the ground. Mm -hmm. Too bad Pete's leg don't work so good no more. <laughs> and that's the moment they see nine or ten circling lights in the sky. And Becky screaming, they're back, they're back. Like now she's finally seems like a person mm -hmm. for and, a moment. <laughs> and I'm wondering, this would be such a cool just UFO story. If not for the farting, it, it's going to be a my pretty much my you know, own. But it, eventually we get to why it serves a purpose. But I'm, I'm glad that you're also like too much farts because I had a hard time listening to it. It's like, geez, OK, yeah, we get it. it and they talk in circles about it for so long because the, our, our four main characters are in two different spots mm -hmm. dealing with two different farters. Farts. And <laughs> they both keep discovering that they're, they keep farting. And we're like, we, we know! Now we just gotta move on! Henry realizes that they're about 10 miles from Hole in the Wall still and then asks Pete if he can see the line to get them to the nearest shelter. And Pete does it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't grab his beer, which probably would have been a good idea at the time. But he sees the line and he can tell, all right, we go over here. We'll go over a hill, go off the road. There's a shack that the roof fell down. If it fell down the right way, we'll be safe. And so they, they, they have a plan now. And then Becky Sue just collapses and they have to drag her the mm -hmm. rest of the way. And that's when they, the first time that we've referenced him only as Douglas before, but this is the first time we they bring up Duddits, who was their fifth. We'll we'll get to Duddits way more in a few chapters. Mm. Uh, but they start their walk back so that they can get them safe, and then Henry will go for the snowmobile and save the day, which I'm sure is exactly how this part's going to play mm -hmm. out. Now we go back to Jonesy and Beaver, who are playing cribbage, cribbage, Cri cribbage, 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 cribbage. cribbage. <laughs> what is this? It's, it's a frog's favorite game. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's almost as good as... Wait, I have to remember it. It's almost as good as the Swedish man with the black hair. This is... What, what the fuck? This was in the book. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah! Yeah, like the Swedish man with blonde hair. This is a... Uh, Something of a different color. A Norse of a different color. Which is yeah. nothing. That makes no sense. Of course it does. Norse have blonde hair. Yeah, but a Norse of a different color isn't anything. <laughs> it's not a play on... No. I love it. It's still good. Uh, then they notice that there's a lot of animals outside, guys. Ben, what did you think about this moment? Once again, it's, it's the little, just single visuals. I recently saw The Green Knight which came How out recently. Is it is an unbelievably beautiful, very, very boring movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I left and I was telling my friends, I enjoyed this movie more once I stopped paying attention to the story hmm. and just experienced it as a series of very fast paintings. So this, I had, I was like, this is all so dumb. The, the farting and the characters are all such fucking goof wads. I enjoyed this more when I stopped viewing it as like a novel and just like a series of shit that's happening. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, like the, the imagining a painting of these guys standing in the doorway of this cozy cabin while 
dozens of animals that should not be walking together aren't even running but slowly walking through your yard that's a really unnerving yeah. thing Have you ever see animals all fleeing a place you follow them you leave too because yep. something bad is gonna happen and we have this beautiful terrifying moment and come back to more farts <laughs> because they just... gets be- it gets better it gets better this part though is when it's the, the farts stop being farts yes. at a certain point because now there's a trail of blood going from the room to the bathroom and they catch with the smell and so now they're trying to get rick's attention and he starts just saying that he needs to poop yeah, poor guy. They're trying to be down the door, and he's just trying to do number two. Right. And he's so hilariously polite. I know. Yeah. Even, even at this point where he's yeah. very clearly dying, mm-hmm. he's just like, come on, guys. Guys. But then my favorite thing happens. They hear a helicopter, and oh, <laughs> Beaver runs out to get its attention, because they, they have a guy that needs medical attention. This better be important later. <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> when this so happens. Great. It, it was just weird because he, he goes out and he's trying to flag down the helicopter while Jonesy's still trying to make sure Rick is okay. And the guy has a bullhorn and he's like, how many of you? And he holds up his fingers for two because he's like, oh, it's me and Jonesy. Yeah. And then the guy's continuing to like explain to him, we're, we're under quarantine. Do you need food? We'll be back. And he's not listening to any of this because he realizes, oh, shit, there's three of us. Or are there five of us because Henry and Pete will be back? And just it has the most poor gosh darn sweetheart has the hardest time (laughs) figuring out how many people there are. (laughs) But the helicopter, you know, he can't make himself heard to say there are five of us. And he's trying to say this guy needs help. There's something wrong with him. And the guy's like, cool, see you later. And the helicopter takes off. (laughs) Well, he holds up, oh, wait, there's five. And the guy just waves back (laughs) thinking it's a wave. That's great. We jump back to Pete and Becky. And she's also missing teeth. And she, at one point, said that Rick was the only one left. And Pete says, you know what? I'm going to go back for that beer. No, no. He's going uh, back for the gun. Goes stuff. back for the rifle. And if rifle. he happens to grab a beer, I mean, why not? You're right there. Yeah. Uh, this part actually. This is very sad. It's so sad and it's so well written. Yes. Th- this is the part where I was like, I turned around yep. on, on Pete. Are you dizzy? What? <laughs> you keep turning around on this book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grow up, see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Grow up. <Come> on. <laughs> Not until I take a dump. <laughs> yeah, tell us about it, Ben. <laughs> so uh, it's so sad because of, once again, as someone who has had problems with, with drinking before, how well represented it is because mm-hmm. he goes back and he's like, I know I can't leave this lady here, but I have to get the guns. I have to. It's really important. And it isn't until he's halfway there when he starts being like, well, the beer's there, too. And by the time he gets to the car, there's this chemical smell, which he doesn't know what it is, but we can assume. Mm-hmm. And he he has this feeling, this bad feeling that there's something small could be in this wreck. Something small is watching him, which uh, we know by this, because this happens after we find out what happens to... Not yet. No? We haven't gotten to the toilet alien yet. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, he he's he goes back, and by the time he gets there, he's like, oh, well, since I'm here, I better grab these these beer. And he grabs a bunch, and then he goes to run, and he stops and goes, well, I'm not going to come out here and just grab half the beer. So he goes back into danger to grab the rest of it, and then leaves having forgotten the guns. Yes. Because, And yikes. his whole, like, as he's drinking them, and he's thinking about, well, I better... I better hide the empties because mm-hmm. I don't want Henry to come back and see that I went and got the beer. Yeah, the the like shame of addiction is extremely, extremely uh, real. Yeah. And while he's sitting in the snow drinking beers, that's when we finally get the flashback. We start going back in time to hear about how they met Duddits. Can we just address it right off the top? Yeah, yeah. Okay. we should. So the word retard is used a lot in this. And, I'd, and I've been thinking about this, and it's not good to hear. And it has a very 
negative connotation because people use it to hurt other people who don't deserve it. This was written in 2001, and this term was still used in research papers, and it wasn't until 2013 that the Social Security Administration officially changed the language because that happened, because people mm -hmm. were just using it as a form of abuse. So they changed it from mental retardation to intellectual disability. Obviously, not excusing it. And in the story, the word is used to hurt as well. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. Sometimes it's just used, but there is that element. And it sucks. It sucks so bad. Especially the, like, not just using it, but the justifications throughout. Like, it's very clear that Stephen King knows, I shouldn't be fucking using this word. All of the characters, when um, they, they finally meet Duddits' mom... And uh, who is it? Pete says uh, the mm -hmm. arsler in front of his mom. Stephen King, the writer, knows, oh, that's fucked up. But then he has the mom be like, that's cool. And it's like, nah, that's this isn't the thing. Well, and that's, that's why I, it, I brought up mm -hmm. that change because I feel like we were in that weird time where people were using it poorly, but it hadn't caught on to yeah. like, the mainstream. We're like, oh, okay, we need to change this because you guys, you horrible human beings have taken a word and you just fucked it. Right. You've taken and, something serious and used it as a punchline. And so I wondered if he, and I'm not saying he should have done this, but I wondered if he was playing around with that. Mm. Like, we have people using it both ways to show that. I think that's you know, giving this a lot of credit. Well, but I'm thinking about Stephen King's obvious political le leanings yes. because of how he posts and no, stuff. And, and I'm like, I I don't know. And obviously, like, I'm I'm not saying, hey, we have to cancel well, Stephen right. King, obviously. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, even with the con societal content, or mm -hmm. context, context, rather, mm -hmm. it still sucks. It yeah. sucks so bad. The thing that I do like about how Duddits is described is, because I've worked with students, you know, little kids who have Down syndrome, he is described with care and heart in a way that if someone reading this has not had that experience makes him a, a human and a human worth your time and attention and I, respect and dignity it, i wish that were true i wish i felt that way i i disagree that the book handles it well i i think it makes some missteps but i think there are some parts of it that are like i i agree that it is very clear that our four main characters truly and sincerely care about this character um, which is which is really cool. Uh, I love the scenes of them like teaching him to play cribbage and like teaching him to swear. That's great. I love it. <laughs> great, yeah. But the whole book, not the characters, but the book is so demeaning to Duddits, even if it is in a like, we love him. It is so at one point, they even say, like, uh, the four main characters, think of him as he was their favorite thing. That's the words King uses. Not favorite person. Not fa He was their favorite thing. Duddits is not used as a, as a character. He is not treated mm -hmm. as a person. He is that trope of the, we were really nice to the special mm -hmm. needs person, so we're really good people. They're constantly, they're constantly saying, you know, Duddits was the best thing we ever did. It was the best thing we ever oh, did okay. yeah. to yep. treat a person like a person. That is not something you should be patting your but I don't, back But I don't about. think that the book is saying, I, I think the book is taking a look outside of that and pointing that out for us. I don't think it's saying, oh yeah, that should be the best thing you ever do. I think it's a commentary on how that shouldn't be an exception. So that should be so the So they're rule. saying it's the best thing they ever did, not as a look at this great thing we did, but it's the best thing we ever did because everything else we've ever done is shit. Yeah, look at them. They're because they're four all sad yeah. really characters. Yeah. Okay, that kind of oh. turns it around. Sorry, and Ben, your point is valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because I... you do have to be very language. Words have meaning. Yes. And but I, I I think King is a smarter writer than that, even on drugs. And I think that's how we're supposed to look at that. Like okay. these flawed people, even when they're doing something good, they're still very flawed. No, it's, I uh, this is just going to re, re 
track old ground so you can cut it. But I just, hey, if the book does it, you can. Do it. <laughs> was it about farts? Well, I was <laughs> grow up, CM. <laughs> grow up, CM. I, hate you guys. Was, I I read the um. He was their favorite thing, not as the word thing, but of all of the people, places, and things in the world, that it's is our favorite of all of the things. Uh, yeah, and and the the best thing we ever did, not being Duddits, but being how they met Duddits, yeah. like that standing up to bullies instance. who were way bigger than them, who by all accounts should have just kicked all of their asses. Yeah, it it felt like because of that special connection that they have to Duddits, that connection gave them the strength to maybe act in a way that I don't think they would have necessarily for just another peer. Yeah. I like your guys's take on it though, because it's that's a broader. A more a world encompassing view mm-hmm. of their whole life. Mine was just very narrow of like what's happening at the moment. Uh, so let's talk about how they met Duddits. Ah, yeah. so- <laughs> <laughs> that was a pain. That was. Noise. I, you, I just remembered. Okay, you were, you're you really know- upset that Duddits uh, interrupted their pussy time. <laughs> <laughs> when i was a young lass me and my girlfriends all we could think about was sausage just oh we going to go to that abandoned warehouse and look at this dude pulling down his pants to show his sausage right guys high five sorry (laughs) grow up sam grow up if the word fart has been overused (laughs) The oh word my god. Pussy this chapter has been twice yes. over you. This, <laughs> this uh, the the Duddits chapters made me wish I had not switched audiobooks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Be- I- because not only do they say the word pussy a thousand times <laughs> very very quickly within the within it's the like course of times two every minutes sentence. Yeah. See, the, the narrator says pussy like a dozen times <laughs> nothing wrong with saying that word pussy no, is fine no. it's just doing i don't want to hear any word that much <laughs> but doing the the dud its voice is the other reason oh yeah all right the audiobook is not fun to listen it's, to okay gonna... just don't do the voice and but it, it's just it's rough yeah it's a fine line between portraying a character that a is with... non-verbal as opposed to why did this character have to be non-verbal and when when you're writing a book when this was written yeah. i don't think you're thinking about audio versions also true and i like... wonder too if authors now revise some things because they know okay on audio, this isn't going to come out the way I want it to, as it does in writing. Yeah, I want to clarify. I didn't mean why does it? Why does the character need to be nonverbal? As though there shouldn't be a nonverbal character. It's just if you are going to have a person who's I don't know what I'm trying to say. Just it's not fun to hear. <laughs> is what I, is the point I'm trying to make? Mm-hmm. Just be respectful. So on their pussy journey, oh, the four boys, the which stuff. is great. What I love is that they're like. There's a picture of this girl's pussy, and we have to go into a warehouse that's, like, off the main road, and they're all like, mm, we are kids, and this is dairy, and a lot of us go missing and die in, <laughs> in secluded areas. But the homecoming queen's pussy, you say? This is 1978. Did anyone do the math? I did not. Me neither. It, it, I, I just wanted to know whether this was on a... A, a year of... A year of... Wh- what year did the Losers Club take down uh, Pennywise? They go back in the 80s, right? So yeah. it would have been the 60s? Okay. So yeah, it was in between times. Mm-hmm. But still, it was really cool yeah. to hear. And they... On their way, they see a torn shirt. And it looks like somebody was dragged in it. And then they find a Scooby-Doo lunchbox. And then they hear just the most horrible scream that they could imagine. Just something that was so full of pure fear. And they rush over and they see these three high school kids and they see a a small kid who has been stripped down to his underwear. He's bleeding. He's got snot in his nose and he's crying. And they're trying to make him eat a dried turd. The fact that they took his clothes off makes me want to kill all of them. Yes. That is so it is horrible. comically evil. Mm-hmm. Not in that it is funny. It is just so over the top that you're like, and also it's three characters we've never met before. 
have not been mentioned. Th- this whole sequence reminded me of the rock fight. Yes. Yeah. Which I, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, I thought this sequence the kid is stuff cool. reminds me of it a lot. Exactly. And this sequence in particular, I think, is the most effective thing that's happened in the entire book. But having these three characters, these three high school toughs, that we don't have the half a book worth of tension building up that, you know, Henry Bowers had, Mm -hmm. it's it comes out of nowhere, kind of. Yeah, you get you find out the kid Richie is he was the uh, the quarterback and he got his nose broken, so he was off the team, and, the and, and he king. was the homecoming king. So his like whole life has just suddenly unraveled because he's a piece of shit, mm-hmm. and he's decided to take it out on this kid because he saw this kid wearing a tiger shirt with his number on it, and so it was that sets him off uh, into just humiliating and threatening this kid's life. Mm-hmm. It is this kid is a an instant monster and it does say after this event that he vows revenge i don't know if that's going to come back later but i sure hope so oh, it I says sure it ho- doesn't oh, he says yeah. that never happened but something else something did. else did yeah. and then later they casually implied they killed a guy but that's that who was knows cool. that was, like, was weird there are a few i i was giving getting on the foreshadowing but between <laughs> that where they're like yeah who is it pete I forget who it is when there's he's oh it's Henry where as he's walking back to hole in the wall he thinks just casually like you know what I'm not thinking about that I'm not thinking about Duddits I'm not thinking about the time that we killed that guy <laughs> yeah. Get, gets I carry can't on. Wait to get to makes it. me yeah. want to keep reading right <laughs> they don't know how to comfort Duddits and Beaver sings him a lullaby and he's like if you guys tell anybody I'll murder you all <laughs> or I'll, I'll never hang out with you guys again that's his threat and then it's just, I love that scene because you can, the way they talk about the beginning, we were four, became five, Mm -hmm. returned to four. You feel them be five the moment that happens. And it's allowing boys to have feelings and show tenderness. It's Mm -hmm. like, thanks. (laughs) They're they're like, all right, we're going to get Duddits. We're we're all going to walk him home. First, we got to go look at that pussy. Turns out it's just a lady. And and she's old. She's like 30. She's like 30 and she's just showing her underwear. (laughs) That's what you get. So they, yeah, so they so they move on. I do like that they're they're all mad. They're like, we came here for this, and I think it's Jonesy who goes, "No, guys, we came here for this," and he gestures yeah. back towards you know saving Duddits. Yeah. Then we jump real quick back to present day because Henry has also been lost in this memory fog, and suddenly he can feel a cloud coming, and he has to get off the road. It's a red black cloud with a movie going on inside it. A scary movie. A scary movie going on inside it. <laughs> I love what he's like, there's a cloud with a movie going, oh, with a movie inside it. That's a stupid thing to think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I but no, I, yeah, That's a stupid thing to think, <laughs> but it wasn't. And I, in my room listening to it, I went, no, nah, you were right the first time. <laughs> well, we didn't mention, but the book mentions quite a few times that Jonesy loves horror movies. Yes. Oh, that's why I like him. <laughs> So he crawls behind a tree and tries not to scream as the mm, Arctic cat cool. goes by. It's, and he's he's like biting into the mm-hmm. bark of the tree so hard he's bleeding and he doesn't realize yeah. it. I liked that bit. That was nice. And he, he realizes that it's going for Pete and that whatever was happening back at camp is done now. One of his friends is dead. One is dying. And one had become a movie star. What? Right. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I got you monster. Is, is it because one of them is played by Timothy Oliphant? I love him too. <laughs> me, me too. He's great. So now we're going to get, let's talk about the horrifying bathroom scene. Because now we're going to get back. Who wants to the take it? The fucking centerpiece of the, of this, the this is the greatest part of this first chapter. It's also kind of illustrating an addiction in a way. To toothpicks? So yeah, we've gotten. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Jonesy and Beaver are outside the door, and they finally bust in because they're hearing horrible sounds, and Rick's finally stopped responding. So They they, they say it's not like passing wind or breaking, or yeah, breaking wind. It sounds like meat tearing. (laughs) (laughs) And you guys want me to grow up? I'm not doing that. (laughs) Grow up, Sam. Come on. Grow up. They bust into the bathroom, and there is blood and excrement on the floor. And Rick's sitting there, and they're like, hey, buddy, you okay? <laughs> and, you know, they do that thing where they, like, 
tap his shoulder, and then he falls over into the tub. He doesn't. He falls forward and bashes his skull yeah, against the rim of the he's tub. He's dead. Yeah. And there's a very abnormally large sized hole in his bottom. There is a about a foot in length. <laughs> yeah. So there's something in the toilet, and Jonesy makes beaver sit down on the toilet to keep whatever is in there from getting out and he's like okay we gotta we gotta secure this somehow because the thing sounds really big so they know they can't flush it because it's not going to flush and so he's going to go out to the shed to look for some tape and leave beaver there and so while he's doing this he's he passes the tape like instantly and doesn't see it he's just searching everywhere and beaver is sitting on the toilet and we're getting more flashbacks of their encounter with Duddits and meeting his mom and just nice fun stuff about building that relationship with him. And they all agreed to walk him to school every day because his mom was worried that the bullies would come after him again. And they'd had a friendship all throughout their, their schooling. And uh, the sad part happens though, when he's sitting there waiting and he just needs, cause this whole time he has been chewing on toothpicks Yes, and it's, other characters have commented that he's always been like that. And, you know, his mom has said, you're going to die from that one day. Like you're going to swallow a toothpick or something. And they don't know how his teeth and stomach stand up to all the minuscule wood chips that he must ingest. Oh, beaver. Yeah. Ha! <laughs> I did not catch on to that. I'm a dumbass. <laughs> so his it's toothpicks <laughs> during, during the scuffle when they were like getting in there to, to, try to save Rick and just seeing this horror, his toothpicks fell out, but there's, there's a couple that didn't fall in blood or shit. And they're just there's standing puddles yeah, of blood and shit everywhere. They're just barely out of reach. And he thinks I'm, I can just lean forward for a second. And if the thing tries to get out, all I have to do is sit back down. And so he does that trying to reach for this toothpick. And this thing must have a sense of what's going on because it, it like blasts its way it breaks the toilet coming out of here this is horrible like i don't have balls but it oh, hurts oh this God. whole part this was actually another instance of if the the dialogue were just <laughs> removed it would be so much more effective because this thing is fucking awful the way he describes yes. it he's like trying to grab it and the underside is like he, what does he say porcupine quills yeah, or something yeah and it's like, it's like meaty and thick and slippery uh, but it wraps its tail around his and junk yeah it, it it bites into or it like crushes one of his balls mm -hmm. and like it says that as he feels his pressure he feels something rupture and i'm like oh mm -hmm. fuck and he didn't know what that is but then he yells out out loud I think that was one of my balls. <laughs> you know, like you would if you were yelling at yourself. Of course. He's he's trying to get a hold of this thing and he flips over on his back because he's like, okay, I'm going to try to crush it. But it, it gets out from under him and then it bites off his nose. And Jonesy is, is coming back at this point and he walks into the bathroom with the tape to see this disgusting toothy worm creature latched onto the beef's face and he has time to yell at him get out of here because he knows that once it's finished with him it's going to come for jonesy which i thought was really sad and sweet before the thing goes for his eyes well the fact that he grips it he jonesy sees him grip it mm -hmm. even tighter so it can't leap for yeah, him he's this was it after it got hard like an erection oh that part yes. was important, super disturbing important to notice this yeah, was like fair just you know? All this pussy stuff, and then the dick stuff is this nasty alien worm getting hard. Wait, you wanted the pussy stuff to be a, a what? No, I what just... What is your problem here? I, I, it's always... Did you want this alien to be more vaginal? No, I mean, it's who just... <laughs> the lady stuff is just always crude and dumb, and the male stuff's always just goofy and brief. That sounds like penises. That's true. <laughs> ah, That's... <laughs> they're dumb <laughs> Uh, Jonesy finally breaks his stunned trance and slams the door, only to realize, I can't barricade this. It opens the other direction. Mm -hmm. And he just grips onto it, doing whatever he can to make sure it doesn't open. Suddenly realizes he is not alone anymore. I wish the book just ended after this. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it would have been the most confused I would have ever been. <laughs> This part's terrifying, though. It's so fucking scary because first the the tension of him, he's just holding on to the the doorknob and he's like covered in blood and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's slippery and he's like, he can feel, what is it? He sees the thing making dents in the Mm -hmm. door and you're like, how the fuck is he going to get in? And then just completely out of nowhere, he turns around he's like, he turns around and there's a fucking gray just standing yep. there. I was super duper grossed out when he's like, it's, you know, they got the eyes right. Mm-hmm. And that was basically like the most the correct feature of the gray men. But there's like this white pus leaking from its eyes. Mm-hmm. And he says a phrase that Jonesy heard when he was in the hospital after his accident when he was kind of like coming in and out, but it doesn't open a mouth to talk. He hears it in his head in the same place that they all have, you know, they all feel the line or hear it or whatever mm-hmm. each of their things are. And then this thing explodes into like red dust and Jonesy breathes it in. That's the part. It's the craziest. Just imagining it taking place in real time as it happens of this like really intense struggle is him on the door. Mm-hmm. And then he turns around and the alien goes, help. And then his head blows <laughs> up. <laughs> that does sound like madness. <laughs> See, that, that's where I'd be like. You know, you'd be like, oh, shit, that's terrifying. And then it explodes. You're like, oh, problem solved. Yeah, done. <laughs> that, this is the scene, the number one scene where I came, like, where it occurred to me that this is just, like, a billion ideas all thrown into a blender. Because <laughs> think of the horror movie premises that are in this book so far. Being trapped in the wilderness by yourself in a snowstorm. A stranger. A stranger coming in t- uh, and not knowing. Disease. UFOs. Butt stuff. Butt stuff. <laughs> There's all of these ideas, and none of them seem to be connected in any way. Oh, yeah, and then the military in a little well, bit. Well, but there... Which is another thing. We we forgot to mention, too, that the red, the frostbite, mm-hmm. is like this red, mossy stuff that yeah. when they go into the bathroom is also all over the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Just this mold growing everywhere. Uh, we take a quick detour over to West Dairy Acres where Roberta who is now widowed she is living into the in this new apartment with Duddits I assumed Duddits was dead because I assumed Duddits was immortal <laughs> oh god maybe <laughs> one of us is going to be right cuz they keep saying that he he doesn't age that he's for he's yeah. forever a child I thought it was more literal. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> I thought I thought it was cuz he died like the, he'd be forever a child was... in their mind because, because he had down he... syndrome yeah yeah <laughs> But no, it turns out Duddits has leukemia Mm. and she's taking care of him. Uh, She's watching the news and uh, it's all about UFO sightings and military running drills up around the Jefferson tract. And can we, I got to tell you guys, just so we don't, I cried like listening to this. I literally cried. It's heartbreaking because at this moment she hears heavy, terrible sobs coming from the other room and it's Duddits. She runs in and she asks what's wrong and he says, Beaver's dead. And then we d- you go away from that. I want yeah. to spend... I, now I want to hold Duddits and sing I, along. I thought his anguish through his mom describing it was mm-hmm. very effective. Now the, the last part before we end this part of our reading is we go back to Pete who is in the most pain he's ever been in his whole life. He uh, at one point passed out in the snow trying to get back because his his leg doesn't work anymore. He is crawling on his elbows and one foot. He finally gets back to where he started, sees the fire, and notices, I hope this comes back later, his watch is running backwards. Mm-hmm. Small detail. And he's trying to talk to Becky and goes over and realizes that the entire ass of her pants has blown completely out. And there's material everywhere, and she's just been dead sitting in you front know, of the fire. And women are stronger because Rick made a big old deal about everything, bitching and moaning the whole time. Becky never said a word. Uh, Rick said he was fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Pete knows something is out there mm-hmm. watching him, which is so terrifying. Yeah. And he knows that it needs something warm and wet either to live in or eat. Yeah. And then he realizes. Oh, yeah, guns. That's what I was going for. Uh, So he grabs a a stick from the fire and is using that to defend himself. And 
he is sitting here holding the stick, which is burning down while he's holding it. And he realizes that Beaver's dead and something terrible's happened to Jonesy. And Pete starts begging whatever this is for some kind of mercy. The, that part, Ugh. at least in the audiobook, is super effective. Yeah. Because him just like begging nothing, basically, yeah. Yeah. just screaming in the wilderness. We know that something has taken Jonesy's body. We don't know what they've done with it yet. And that Henry and Pete are both picking up voices of military specialists talking about something. They're just hearing mm-hmm. these these voices. And then his head fills with screams and people dying. Doesn't sound great. No. And then a moment well, later. And people saying we're we're not dangerous. Yeah, yeah. there's no there's no uh infection. Dis- infection. Mm-hmm. Which I didn't know if they were the aliens talking <laughs> well <laughs> yeah because at, at first you're like oh it's the military and there's there must be other people in this unincorporated land and they're just wiping everyone out but pete who is immediately attacked by another one of these worm monsters mm-hmm. after he gets his hand fucked yeah and, and the red moss starts growing in it immediately which is can, horrible he can feel it growing in his hand Ugh. like cancer God. he says uh, which was the original title of this book? Uh, fun really? Fact. Yes. Growing oh. in your hand like cancer? No, says? just, just <laughs> cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Growing in your hand like cancer is uh, a metal band, I think. Uh, um, that makes sense. But uh, he he fucks this worm up, mm-hmm. throws it in the fire, and kills it. But after he does that, he he thinks about all of these screams he's hearing in his head as they fade out and thinking, wait a second. Are those these monsters? Because if so, fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> fuck these guys. <laughs> that was they, which hilarious. is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we skipped over him stomping the thing to death and all the tendons in his knee Ooh, tearing. And yeah. his knee goes inside. Oh, no. Oh. And he lays there knowing that he cannot die soon enough. He's just laying there after he's, he threw the creature in the fire and listen to it burn and scream. And he's just laying there broken and hurt. That's... He knows that Jonesy's on the snowmobile coming for him. And he's just like, oh, please let me die before any of this happens. <laughs> and closes his eyes. Uh, now, Ben, you said you had a question that you wanted to pose about these four main characters at the very beginning of the episode. Do they all have the same powers? I think it it's slightly similar, but it manifests in different ways. See, they, they kind of make it feel that way, except there are like two of them who their powers are just telepathy. It's like they're they're knowing things because Jonesy picks up on the student's thoughts because he was yeah. he was cheating was on his mind. Yes. That's how he knows. Which is pretty much the same thing that the beaver did beaver. at the beginning. Because he just knows crotchless panties. <laughs> Pete's though was finding the line, but they all talk. But about they all talk the about the line, so, yeah, which I is think... why I'm like, do they all just share the same kind, like powers? I think but so. But Pete's just better at finding <laughs> stuff, I guess. Well, I don't it's know. at NASA. You know, he's yeah. he loves space, so he's. <laughs> I don't know. Makes sense. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode, where we will be reading through part two for Joshua Khan and Benjamin Graham. I'm CM Alexander, reminding you. Maybe death was out there, and maybe it called your name. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to Dreamcatcher Part 1. We hope you enjoyed it. And thank you again to Lisa Khan for her pick. This episode is sponsored by Old World Style Beard and Skin Care. Handmade and completely natural, nothing goes into any product that you can't spell or pronounce. We love their products, and because we can't do anything normal, we wrote ads for each other to read. And I'm going to read Josh's, despite not having a beard. Here we go. I have been using the Sandalwood Bourbon Beard Balm for weeks now, and I've never smelled more like Roland Deschain. My beard is noticeably softer and feels better all day long. It doesn't leave me feeling like I've left a product in, which has been my biggest problem with beard balms in the past. Simply put, it feels comfortable, and what more could you ask for in a product you put on your body? You care about what gets absorbed into your skin, and that's why these people take pride in their process and their ingredients. 
with smells like sandalwood bourbon, cedar leather, and more at oldworldbeardandskin.com. Feel confident in your skin with these products. Our listeners can use promo code DPR10 for 10% off your order. That's DPR10 at oldworldbeardandskin.com. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.